Wow, shit, man. Hey, very interesting. I, I should, I should, I should have one day talk with you. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll start with the uh, webinar. So welcome to our Philippine Business Clinic webinar. So today we are actually very honored to be able to um, invite two groups of expert speakers from Enterprise Singapore and C and G Law. So from Enterprise Singapore, we have Darren, uh, Angelica, and Elvin. From C and G Law, we have the three partners from uh, App, Rain, and Miggy. So today's agenda will be actually presentation and insight from Enterprise Singapore. They will touch on COVID impacts on businesses, latest development opportunities, market overview of Philippines. And from CNG Law, they will be touching on market entry, foreign ownership, incorporation requirements, tax rates and reliefs, physical incentives, ease of doing business, general labor principles, and COVID related um, issues during the enhanced community quarantine. And last, we have the Q&A discussion. So 
SBF also recently um, launched two new initiatives. The first one is actually we call it a COVID business helpline. This is actually to provide um, additional avenue for companies uh, to give us feedback on business related issues and concern due to the outbreak. We also be able to help um, companies to navigate the government advisories, leverage on the business support measures announced during the budget, and also update them on the latest um, international advisory, such as border restrictions and movement of goods. So you can contact us via email and the hotline shown on the screen. The next initiative is actually called the Global Connect at SBF. This is in partnership with Enterprise Singapore to help companies to internationalize. So regardless whether you are at the information gathering stage or you're all ready to set up, even if you already have operations in the country, you'll still be able to um, contact us and we'll try our best to assist you. So you can also contact us through our email and the hotline shown on the screen. And very soon we'll be setting up our first um, overseas center in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, and followed by Indonesia in Jakarta. So please do not hesitate to contact us. And lastly, uh, SBF also organized overseas market workshop to allow companies to have a first-hand uh, in-market experience. And the next workshop to the Philippines will be held on the 26th to the 30th of July. So if you are interested to find out more or interested to participate in this workshop, please uh, contact me or visit our SBF website. And now without further ado, I will hand the time to Darren for his presentation. Darren, please. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Uh, first, let me get the slides up first. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Darren. So myself, Angelica, and Alvin are based in the Philippines. Uh, I'm temporarily back in Singapore because of COVID-19. Um, so to, for today's presentation, we have three portions or three segments. Um, the first will briefly give you an update regarding how the situation is in the Philippines. Um, this part, Angelica and Alvin will share more. The second portion of the presentation will be about um, the Philippines. We'll give a broad uh, market overview of the country, um, some of the key growth areas to look at. And last but not the least, uh, Enterprise Singapore will also share some of our upcoming activities once we are cleared of COVID, um, some of the mission trips that we like to um, undertake. Yeah. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let me invite Angelica to share about the COVID-19 situation. Okay, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Darren. So I think on your screens right now, you will see um, the current status updates in the Philippines in terms of confirmed cases, deaths, and recoveries as of yesterday, April 20. So um, to give you a broader view, what these numbers reflect um, actually shows that the Philippines is the third highest um, in terms of number of cases in Southeast Asia, just uh, right after Singapore and Indonesia. Uh, our death rate is at par with a global average of about 6%, while our recovery rate is still far behind and lagging at only 9%. Um, what is important to note that isn't here on the slide is that our number of confirmed cases over the last two weeks um, have been anywhere between 200 to 300, despite the increasing testing capabilities. And analysts are optimistic that we are somehow flattening the curve in this regard. Um, so basically in terms of government initiatives, uh, to minimize the overall impact, the Philippine government in March passed a law specifically to combat the 2020 pandemic. Um, I think similar measures have been put across several, several countries, and this law um, is aimed to primarily first improve healthcare capacity to prevent the collapse. Second is ensure that the welfare of the citizens, especially the poorest of the poor, are well accounted for. Third is to provide financial support to individuals and SMEs 
through various credit and grant schemes. And lastly is limit movement in mobility within the re key regions in the Philippines without, of course, compromising the supply chain. So um, I guess to also share in a, in a more um, personal view, how life in general is here. Um, our country was put on lockdown or what we call the enhanced community quarantine in early March. Um, this was the time when our cases were actually way below the 100 mark and is initially expected to last until the end of April. However, to date, uh, probably four to five weeks after the ECQ was put in place, um, we are still scrambling to address some challenges. So while people, um, while well, some people are fortunately adjusted to life at home, uh, there's still confusion and the social divide that plague our surroundings. Mm, government directives are being rolled out on a very piecemeal basis as officials figure out the optimal balance, which creates um, a general confuse, confusion among people. Uh, on top of that, a huge percentage of our population are hovering slightly above and below the poverty line, thus making it very difficult for them to make ends meet with the ECQ in place, um, resulting to many people still out on the streets. So extending or lifting the ECQ in the next week will be definitely a balancing act on government's part to ensure the maximum benefits for both the health and the economy, as well as life and livelihood in the country. Uh, the next slide, uh, the next slide uh, will aim to show all of you uh, just a very brief and basic overview of the two most impacted sectors in the Philippines, as well as one potential area of growth. Um, so on top of the global supply chain dis disruptions, preventing us to reassemble and re-export products, manufacturing companies in the Philippines are also much very, are very much also struggling to operate in compliance with the guidelines set by the government, forcing, of course, most companies to te temporarily put their operation on hold and reducing output significantly. Um, what might be interesting to most is the effect of um, COVID-19 on our domestic demand for consumption. So re retail will be one of the most hit uh, sectors amidst this pandemic. The lockdown has put the country's most populous island to, unhold, to a halt. And on top of that, consumer confidence was already ebbing way before the lockdown, and it is not expected to pick up anytime soon. Um, plus, compounded effects from other sources and support sectors such as, let's say, tourism and remittances from overseas Filipino, will worker, overseas Filipino workers will definitely add to the losses to be seen in the retail sector. However, um, while many traditional sectors are seen to suffer huge losses. Technology and disruptive innovation present opportunities for growth due to the limited mobility and people adjusting to what we call now the new normal. Um, we've seen financial institutions and online companies have increased in their activities over the last month and online transactions through mobile applications are expected to spill over a wide array of goods and services offered on the internet. Um, so I think that was just a long-winded way of saying that stakeholders believe that the post-COVID-19 situation will provide vast opportunities in terms of areas such as fintech, agritech, e-commerce and health tech, among others. So I think Darren will dive deeper into a few of these in the next few slides also. Okay, thank you, Angelica. So before we move on, um, we'd like to invite Alvin to share a little about the situation in Davao. He's not based in Davao, but he has been in close contact with our contacts in Davao. Um, so Alvin, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Darren. Hi, everyone. Um, so zooming in on another, another key city south of the Philippines, um, Davao is the largest city in terms of land area. 
uh, and the third most populous city in the country, with about 1.6 million in population. Um, it is situated in Mindanao, the Philippines' food basket, where 40% of the country's food needs are sourced from and contributes around um, 30% to national food trade. About one-third of its land area is devoted to agriculture uh, due to the fact that the sector is its largest economic driver, comprised of export grade bananas, pineapples, mangoes, um, pomelo, um, and uh, locally, Davao is known to be the Durian capital of the Philippines. So as Davao is the main trade, commerce, and financial hub of Mindanao, the city is considered to be a MICE destination for uh, meetings, incentives, um, conventions, uh, and exhibitions, complementing another economic driver, um, which is the tourism sector. So hotels, resorts, and um, a number of convention centers have shut down due to the community quarantine imposed by the local government. Um, another emerging sector is the BPO, or the Business Process Outsourcing, which employs about 50,000 um, and have suffered in terms of reduced operations and forced work-from-home arrangements implemented by local authorities. Um, based on a recent webinar hosted by a local consultancy firm, discussing the impacts of COVID-19. Um, uh, the president of Davao Chamber of Commerce, Mr. John Tria, shared um, that banana and pineapple plantations continue to export abroad, but the domestic market, um, given the mandated closure of business establishments, demand for fresh produce, um, have significantly declined. And in order to help the affected uh, vegetable farmers, um, the Davao government city government led by Mayor Sara Duterte have ordered to buy in bulk vegetables, which will then be given for free to its constituents, complementing its food tax distributions to affected residents who have lost their livelihood. So next slide, please. Yeah, yeah okay. for the market over... Sorry, Darren, you want me to continue? I uh, know, it's okay. So okay. For, I think one of the key points as to why we share um, the situation in Manila as well as in Davao is because Philippines is an island state. So although we see that the Luzon is on an enhanced community quarantine, Davao in very much life is still goes on as usual. Um, although is there some impact, but we do see some capacity uh, being shifted from Luzon to Davao. So that's something for, for businesses to consider. Uh, but when you just look at Philippines, it's to not look at it entirely just based out of Manila, but you can look at other cities as well which might be more open um, to investments as well. Yeah, so I will now go on to give a very brief overview of the Philippines. Okay, so the data that's presented that you see now is all pre-COVID. Uh, and very clearly, Philippines have been experiencing consistent healthy GDP growth rate of more than 6% since 2012. But because of COVID, you can see that uh, the latest forecast is that GDP growth rate will drop to 0.6% whereas unemployment rate will rise up to 6.2%. Um, in terms of the sector that contributes to the economy, um, it has been largely driven by services, followed by industries and agriculture sector. And the major pillars have always been business process outsourcing, remittances, and tourism, each account for 10% of the economy. So as you can see, when Luzon is on lockdown, the BPO sector is uh, clearly affected. Um, remittances, when the overseas laborers uh, have their, when they have issues keeping their jobs because of the ongoing COVID situation globally, um, this will have an impact on remittances. In fact, projections are already, or rather data are already coming saying that remittances are expected to drop. Uh, tourism is a given, it will be negative. Yeah. But having said so, um, we should look at the consumer market in the Philippines um, and expect it to stay vibrant and attractive in the long run. Um, the main reason is that, yes, COVID-19 will have a big impact for, on 2020, but the majority of the population remains under 29 years old. So as they uh, mature or, or as you go along, the, the country's uh, demographic will enable workers, and this will basically drive on the uh, manufacturing sector, the BPO sector, as well as the consum consumption sector, uh, anything related to consumers. Yeah, and... The other part that we should also appreciate is that actually Filipinos are very open to global brands. Uh, 
Primarily, this could be because of the multicultural influences as well as the Filipinos' um, exposure to foreign brands. So this is something that um, Singapore companies should consider on how to tap on uh, Filipino openness to try new brands to, to promote their services and brands. In terms of the infrastructure space, the Philippines government has launched uh, new initiatives. Um, projects like Build, Build, Build is meant to accelerate infrastructure development. Um, in the last few years, the administration acknowledged that infrastructure investments has lagged uh, in the previous administration. So the whole point of the Build, Build, Build program is essentially to catch up or increase infrastructure spendings so that you can address logistical inefficiencies um, and basically make the country more competitive. Having said so, um, on this part, uh, I think COVID will have the biggest impact on government initiatives, given that fundings are being um, directed to fight COVID as well as in polit poverty, uh, ad poverty uh, elevations uh, policies. Yeah. In terms of the tax space, we see that the Philippines has the most room for growth. Um, and this, there will be a lot of opportunities for funding and deal making, given that it's still at an infant stage. And as what Angelica has shared, um, what we do see as a positive outcome of COVID is that it has driven um, adoption of online banking, and the figures have jumped uh, significantly in the last few months. Yeah, so fintech will certainly be one of the sectors um, that companies can look for given that many, much of the population is still considered at the bank. Okay, so I come to the last part of our presentation. Um, so post-COVID, or rather once uh, we hope that the situation will turn and uh, Philippines and Singapore will both be open and resume to normalcy, um, there are certain activities that we hope to focus on. So first, Philippines as a consumer market, uh, we hope to work with SBF to do a business mission that's in line with the food services. Um, the second area that we, the second program we want to work with is this project called Singaporean. Uh, essentially, it's a, it's a pop-up uh, event that we, the Enterprise Singapore is, uh, is promoting. So in the first run in 2019, we brought 15 over companies to the Philippines um, for, for, for a period of 10 days, whereby they showcase their products. So the objective of Singaporean is really to help companies um, obtain live data about how consumers, how Filipino consumers view their, view their products and services. And from there, to fine tune their internationalization strategy. In terms of the infrastructure space, we'll be doing business mission in the infrastructure services and built environment. So we hope that companies in these sectors uh, will be interested to, to join the mission trips. Last but not the least, uh, for innovation side, we are hoping to pilot the Global Innovation Alliance pilot program. So this part here, we hope to bring uh, eligible Singapore startups to the Philippines and to work with our partners to, to explore the Philippines and to get a head start. And last but not the least, we also be looking at some of the uh, initiatives in Philippines. So Philippines is trying to do its own version of FinTech Festival. Um, this is partly in collaboration with Singapore FinTech Festival, but it will be based out of Philippines. So we hope our companies can participate in the Philippines run as well. So um, for ESG side, we hope that we can help companies to either to, um, on, in, in a few areas. First of all, is in business matching. Second is to tap on our contacts with a foreign government. And last but not the least, uh, we hope to connect you to relevant professional services providers and um, other trade promotion uh, agencies. So these are contact details of, uh, of the team. So myself, um, based in, should be based in Manila, but just back in Singapore. Angelica and Alvin are reverse in Manila, and Patricia covers the Philippines out of Singapore. And we also leave you with a list of contacts um, that may be useful for you to refer to uh, when you need to talk about understanding the law, understanding the setup process, yeah. and as well as our co-working spaces contacts. So that's all for from Enterprise Singapore. I'll pass it on back to Derek. Yeah, and we'll be looking forward to answer any questions during the Q&A session. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Enterprise Singapore team in Manila. So the next part of the presentation will be by CNG. And let's welcome Deb. 
Yeah, uh, let me just um, put my slides up. Sure. Okay. Um, so I guess everyone can see uh, the slides. Um, so essentially, we're just here to give you an overview of what uh, doing business in the Philippines is about and some of the legal considerations that a lot of our clients uh, look into and consider uh, before they start uh, doing business in the Philippines. So I think the very first question that our clients ask is whether or not their activities would constitute doing business. And this is an important question because uh, some clients are not ready to enter the Philippine market and so they don't want to be considered doing business, which triggers the registration and licensing requirements. And I think this uh, question becomes more relevant in the world that we live in today because the internet has created a, a, an avenue for us to, to conduct borderless transactions. So you see uh, transactions beginning in one country, being processed in another country, and being completed in another country. And when you have all of these different transactions involved, um, whether or not you're doing business in the Philippines um, becomes an important question. So our laws provide some clear-cut definitions of what would constitute doing business, like if you solicit orders, if you appoint a representative under your control in the Philippines. Um, but we do have a catch-all provision that provides that if you conduct acts that show the continuing body or substance of your business, or if you perform acts um, which are in, in, in a progressive prosecution of your business activity, then you would be considered doing business. Um, it's really a fact-driven exercise and would depend on the circumstances of each case. Um, there are activities which are not considered doing business in the Philippines. And as I mentioned, if you're not doing business in the Philippines, uh, you're not required to set up an entity or uh, register uh, with our government authorities. So if you invest uh, as a shareholder in a domestic corporation and exercise your rights as a shareholder, then uh, that's not considered doing business in the Philippines. Uh, one of the items I want to focus on is uh, appointing an independent distributor in the Philippines. A lot of times when we flag to our clients that their activities would constitute doing business, uh, the workaround that we usually suggest is to find a, a local partner in the Philippines who will be their independent distributor. So the independent distributor will take care of, let's say, the importation, uh, selling, advertising, and marketing. And in this situation, uh, the foreign entity, even if it has entered into a commercial transaction in the Philippines and is earning income, it would not be considered doing business and it would not be subject to uh, having to establish a corporate entity or, or register with the labor authorities or, or other government authorities. So if you are considered doing business or if you just want to enter the Philippine market and set up, um, foreign, uh, there are several uh, corporate vehicles that you can choose to establish. Um, more often than not, foreign entities would want to set up a subsidiary or a corporation, uh, a branch office or a representative office. Um, there are other corporate vehicles available, but uh, others have more limited purpose, so um, we'll just be discussing these three today. So when, you, when we say a corporation or a subsidiary, it's essentially a corporation with shares of stock. A majority of the shares are usually owned by the foreign entity. In fact, uh, a foreign entity can own up to 100% of the shares subject to nationality restrictions in certain industries. Um, so, um, yes, 100% can be owned by a foreign entity, but because a corporation requires a functioning board of directors and officers, um, we see our clients would have to sometimes assign uh, some of their shares um, in trust to individuals who will act as their board of directors or officers. So a corporation or a subsidiary in the Philippines would be a separate legal entity from the foreign entity. And that means that the, the Philippine subsidiaries obligations and liabilities um, are separate from the foreign entity and cannot be enforced against the foreign entity. 
Um, in fact, because they are separate legal entities, uh, the, the subsidiary can have uh, any business, in fact, different from the foreign entity as provided in its Articles of Incorporation. Um, a branch office and representative office, these are extensions of the foreign company or the foreign entity um, and is granted a license to do business in the Philippines as a branch office or representative office. So because it's an extension, uh, the liabilities and obligations of these entities in the Philippines would be attributable to the foreign entity. So a branch office um, can earn income in the Philippines and essentially does the business activities of the foreign parent company. So uh, whatever business the foreign parent company is engaged in, uh, that's the business of the branch office uh, as approved by the Securities and Exchange Commission in its uh, corporate documents. A representative office is more of a limited purpose office. It's also known as a liaison office. Um, it is not allowed to earn uh, income in the Philippines or have any income generating activities and essentially provides uh, incidental services or support services to its parent company, such as uh, liaising between clients and customers and the parent company, or uh, information disseminations, marketing activities. So we do have clients that uh, have independent distributor uh, uh, distributorship agreements with local entities, but at the same time, they want to have some kind of local presence in the Philippines. And so they set up a representative office so they can see how the Philippine market is responding uh, to their products so that they can have better customer service and, and client services. Um, so as I mentioned, a corporation will require uh, individuals to uh, run the board and, and to be officers. So as I mentioned, the foreign entities sometimes assign uh, qualifying shares to certain individuals because to become a director in a Philippine corporation, you need at least one share. Um, so aside from a board of directors, you need officers, uh, a president, a corporate secretary, and a treasurer. So um, the corporate secretary and treasurer do not have to be uh, directors in the corporation, which means they don't need shares in the corporation, but they are required to be residents of the Philippines and the corporate secretary must also be a Filipino citizen. Uh, a branch office representative office, you only need to appoint a resident agent in the Philippines, uh, which can be an individual or even a company. Okay, capitalization requirements. So um, a corporation which has more than 40% foreign equity is considered a foreign corporation. Um, if it's 40% or less, so meaning the Filipino ownership in that corporation is 60% or more, it's, it's generally considered a Filipino corporation. So if you are a foreign uh, corporation, meaning more than 40% foreign owned, um, and you engage in business in the Philippines, uh, you're considered a domestic market enterprise, which has a minimum paid up capital of $200,000, uh, or the Philippine equivalent of $200,000. There are exceptions to this rule, um, such as if you're involved in advanced technology, or if you employ at least 50 uh, direct employees, then you can reduce the minimum capitalization to $100,000. If you're engaged in an export-oriented uh, industry, export services, or export uh, products and you export at least 60% of those products or services, then you are not subject to the $200,000 minimum capitalization. Um, branch office, you have the same and on, uh, an additional requirement for branch offices is uh, they're required to submit a deposit to the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, after they have been given their license to transact business. Um, and the deposit should be at least uh, 500,000 pesos, which is about $10,000. Um, with an additional annual deposit depending on the gross income of the branch. A representative office is fully funded by uh, the parent company um, with a minimum uh, remittance of $30,000. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, of these entities? So I think um, from a incorporation requirement standpoint, uh, the subsidiary or the corporation would be easier in a sense to set up uh, because the documentary requirements are uh, less and also they can be executed in the Philippines. Unlike a branch office or a representative office, the documentation that you need would essentially come from your foreign parent company. You would need a board authorization or board resolution authorizing the opening of that office. 
uh, you would need to submit financial statements to show the financial capability of the foreign parent company and compliance with certain financial ratios. Um, and you would need proof of the remittance of the funds from the foreign parent company. Um, and generally, this documentation would have to be authenticated in a Philippine embassy or apostilled um, before they can be submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, conducting business, the subsidiary, you can conduct uh, whatever business you want to engage in subject to nationality restrictions as provided for in your Articles of Incorporation. While a branch office uh, will be limited to the business purpose of the foreign parent company. Representative office, as I mentioned, can't engage in any income generating business activities. Um, so the disadvantages, as I mentioned, um, a corporation will need a functioning board of directors and, and officers. So there is that requirement to elect the directors, elect the officers, have annual stockholders meeting. Um, unlike a branch office or representative office, that only requires um, a resident agent. Um, they, they don't need to undergo uh, you know, all of these annual stockholder meetings and board of directors meetings uh, and so on. Also, as mentioned, for a branch office, there is that deposit required and that deposit is really meant to secure local creditors um, from liabilities of the, of the branch. So uh, in the Philippines, we regularly release a foreign investment negative list. The latest one was issued in 2018, the 11th foreign in investment negative list. It, it will list down all the industries or business activities where uh, foreign equity is restricted. So I just want to highlight a few of the activities that, that I've seen become more relevant uh, lately. First, mass media. Why has this become uh, relevant today? It's because of the internet. We have a lot of clients who, are, who want to have gaming apps. They want to have applications with live streaming. They have social media platforms uh, and things like that. And we always have to flag the risk that some of those activities uh, could be considered mass media. The way that our law defines mass media is very broad. Uh, it's basically a, a platform which allows information dissemination that changes the way people think. Um, and because of that broad definition, uh, there, are, there have been opinions and cases that have recognized the internet as a platform for mass media. So we often flag that, that uh, especially to um, tech companies or, or companies that want to have live streaming or even posting of advertisements. Uh, or leasing of digital spaces in their, in their platform or website, that those might be considered a mass media. Um, retail trade. So we do have a retail trade law, um, which does not allow foreign ownership um, in retail trade enterprises with a paid up capital of less than $2.5 million. So Aside from that, there are other pre-qualification requirements such as net worth of your parent company should be $200 million. So very high uh, capitalization requirements for retail trade. So some of the workarounds we suggest is, uh, well, one, if you can list your product as a luxury good. So essentially, luxury good are goods uh, which are not needed for, for everyday use or they're not basic commodities. And uh, this would include, let's say, jewelry or branded products. And then you would apply with our National Economic Development Authority to be listed as a luxury or high-end product. And this would reduce the minimum capitalization requirement to $250,000 for luxury goods or high-end products. Um, Another uh, workaround to the retail trade law that we suggest is uh, becoming a wholesaler or supplier. So you can establish an entity in the Philippine market um, as a wholesaler. You will import your products and in turn you can sell it to retail establishments or other entities. Because wholesale activities, those activities where you sell to the, to the retail establishments or to the other entities, um, it's not subject to a retail trade loss. So the minimum capitalization you would, requ you would be required to comply with is the $200,000 for domestic market enterprises. So advertising agencies, uh, this is also another uh, activity that we see a lot because Yes, internet companies, they sometimes, uh, let's say, um, review products. Uh, one of the services they, they provide is reviewing products and then somehow advertise that product. Uh, conceptualizing advertisements is uh, considered advertising agency and subject to a 30% foreign equity restriction. 
So 40% foreign equity, you have uh, exploration and development of natural resources. Uh, so investors who want to uh, invest in renewable energy sector uh, it would be subject to this foreign equity restrictions. Ownership of private lands, so foreign entities cannot own private lands in the Philippines. They are allowed to lease, have long-term lease agreements over land, or they can buy condominium units. Um, and the condominium corporation will be the one to comply with the 40% requirement. Uh, operation of public utilities, so telecommunication services, um, provision of uh, water, electricity, um, so on, that's subject to 40% foreign uh, equity restrictions. So essentially, the incorporation process is submission of documents to the Securities and Exchange Commission. The documents would be your corporate documents for the corporation, branch office, representative office. Essentially, these are the documents uh, that allow the, the entity to do business in the Philippines. Um, after incorporation, you would have to register with our other government authorities and government agencies like our tax authorities, uh, the local government unit where you're operating, and labor-related registrations. Of course, depending on the industry uh, that you're in, uh, there are special licenses that may be applicable after post-incorporation. So uh, if you're going to do importation, you will need to get registration from Bureau of Customs. Let's say if you're in the food industry, you might need to get some uh, licenses, uh, license to operate or certificates of product registration or notification with our Food and Drug Administration. So it will really depend on uh, your industry. So that's a basic overview of uh, incorporation uh, in the Philippines, post-incorporation and some of the considerations uh, for doing business in the Philippines. Um, I will turn you over to my colleague, uh, Rain. Uh, who will discuss uh, tax consequences and tax considerations of doing business in the Philippines. Hi everyone, um, this is Rain. I will be discussing the tax considerations of doing business in the Philippines. Okay, so, so for today, the topic outline will, will include tax rates of, under the Philippine Tax Code versus the Philippine-Singapore Tax Treaty, incentives uh, under Philippine laws, and the Ease of Doing Business Act. So currently, the Philippines has more than 40 effective tax treaties with other countries. Um, included here is the tax treaty with, with Singapore. So the applicable, applicable tax rates for a non-resident foreign corporation will depend on what type of income it will earn. And the, the rules and the, the rates that will apply will also depend on whether what will be invoked is our Philippine tax code or the Singapore Philippines tax treaty. For my discussion, I will focus on the tax treaty rates in as much as the Singapore is, is a treaty country. So if an enterprise is uh, earning business profits or income in the Philippines. So please uh, focus your attention on the rightmost um, column. So the tax treaty rates is essentially 30% of the net income if the entity has a permanent establishment in the Philippines and not subject to Philippine taxes if no permanent establishment in the Philippines. So, so what is a permanent establishment? Um, a permanent establishment is a technical term under the treaty. It may include a branch, an office, a factory, a workshop, a warehouse, or uh, furnishing of services, including consultancy services by a Singapore enterprise to a Philippine enterprise for periods or, per or, or for a period or periods aggregating more than 183 days. So there are also other types of non-resident foreign corporations. So these are cinematographic film owner, lesser distributor, they are entitled to uh, special rates of 25% of gross income. If you're a non-resident owner or lesser of vessels, 4.5% uh, of gross rentals, lease or charter fees. Non-resident lesser of aircraft, machineries and other equipment, 7.5% of gross rentals or fees. For dividends, under the treaty, uh, the tax rate shall not exceed 15% if uh, the recipient own, 
owns at least 15% of the outstanding shares of the paying company and 25% in all other cases. So if the remittance is in the form of a branch profits remittance tax, then the rate that will apply is uh, a fixed rate of 15%. For royalties, the tax shall not exceed 15% if the investment is made in key areas uh, identified by the Philippine Board of Investment and 25% in all other cases. For interest, uh, the general rate is 15%. However, you can enjoy a 10% low, lower rate if the interest arises from uh, in respect of public issues of bonds, debentures, or similar obligations. If the income earned is a gain from sale of shares of stock, the rate is 5% to 10% on <coughs> net capital gains derived, and um, it may be exempt from Philippine taxes if the shares sold do not consist principally of immovable property. So, uh, what does that consist principally of immovable property mean? Um, it means that 51% or, or higher of the, of the property of that domestic corporation is, uh, owns uh, immovable property, then such a gain from sale of shares of stock will be taxable in the Philippines. So how can you avail of uh, the treaty rates? If, uh, if you look at this, the, the heading, if you are earning dividends, interests, and royalties, we have what we call a self-assessment system and automatic withholding of taxes. This means that a Philippine payor will automatically withhold taxes under the treaty as if the Singapore entity is already entitled to it. However, the non-resident claiming, uh, claiming the lower rate is required to submit uh, like a certificate of residence, like proof that it is a, a resident of Singapore and then the Philippine entity withholding agent will submit such a certificate of residence to the BIR within 30 days from payment of the withholding taxes. True. If what you are earning are other types of income, example, capital gains or business profits, then uh, we, you are required or, or the Philippine withholding agent is required to file a tax treaty relief application with our uh, tax authorities uh, with complete submission of documentary requirements. So it's not uh, automatic. So uh, for incentives, generally um, there are several laws which grant uh, tax incentives to different enterprises. Um, the, the general law is the Omnibus Investments Code. The special laws, um, there are several but I've I've just chosen uh, three, uh, three of the major uh, special laws for purposes of uh, the discussion. Okay. For uh, under the Omnibus Investments Code, which is the general law, uh, it provides incentives to encourage investments um, uh, in activities listed in the government's investment priorities plan. So the 2017 or the current IPP uh, includes manufacturing, including agro-processing, uh, innovation drivers, example of these are research and development activities such as clinical trials, centers of excellence, business incubation hubs. And an, another investment priority plan is inclusive business models. Examples of these are agribusiness and tourism activities that provide business opportunities to micro and small enterprises. So the fiscal incentives under the Omnibus in the Investments Code, uh, in, it includes income tax holiday for six years or four years, deduction for labor, duty-free importation of capital equipment, tax credit for taxes and duties on imported raw materials used, and exemption from dues and export taxes for non-traditional exports. Non-fiscal incentives include simplification of customs procedure, unrestricted use of consigned equipment, employment of foreign nationals. There are also additional incentives granted to enterprises which locate in less developed areas. Um, examples of deductions are uh, those necessary and major infrastructure 
costs if an enterprise locates in an area that is deficient in, let's say, infrastructure and public utilities. So to, how do you qualify for a tax incentives? First, um, under the Omnibus Investment Code, first you will register with our Board of Investments. Um, those qualified are um, enterprises which are Philippine-owned, or if not Philippine-owned, then that enterprise should be engaged in a pioneer project or export of production. And of course, the activity that you would have chosen is will fall into the IPP or the Investments Priorities Plan which I projected uh, earlier. So these special laws uh, granting tax incentives, uh, one of these are the Special Economic Zone Act of 1995. So special economic zones, these are ser areas selected by the government for development and operation as industrial, agro-industrial, commercial, banking, financial, or tourist or rec recreational centers. So currently, we have uh, more than 380 special economic zones operating throughout the country. Um, most uh, operating zones are IT parks, 70% uh, of that, and manufacturing centers which are about 20%. Most are located in Metro Manila, although there is also a good number in the Visayas region, such as uh, Cebu, Iloilo, and Negros Occidental, and Southern Luzon, and there's also one in Davao. So the fiscal incentives granted if you are a locator in such economic zone or uh, income tax holiday, four years or six years depending on the, the project, and a special 5% tax, um, once your ITH has ended, then you can still enjoy a lower rate of special 5% tax on gross income this in you of all national and local taxes, tax and duty-free importation, VAT zero rating of local purchases of goods and services, and exemption from expanded withholding tax. So the non-fiscal incentives uh, include simplified import and export procedures, employment of foreign nationals in supervisory, technical, or advisory positions. Uh, how can you avail of the incentive under the Special Economic Zone Act? So for this, you will register with a different government agency and it's called the Philippine Economic Zone Authority. The uh, second special law that I will discuss which grants tax incentives is the Basis Conversion and Development Act of 1992. So, the BCDA, it was uh, created to manage the conversion into alternative uses of lands covered by the 1947 military basis agreement between the United States and the Philippines. So this includes the Subic Naval Base and the Clark Military Reservations and the Clark Air Base, which were declared special economic zones and free port zones. So what are the incentives if you're a locator in the Subic Economic Zone? Uh, and the Clark Freeport Zone, so that's, there's a 5% tax on gross income in lieu of national and local taxes, tax and duty-free importation of raw materials and capital equipment. And so where will you register? So for this, uh, you will register with a different uh, local government uh, agency. So for Subic, it's the Subic Bay Metropolitan Authority. For Clark, it's the Clark Development Corporation. So apart from uh, Subic and Clark, there is also a Poro Point Freeport Zone. Um, there's a, uh, one in La Union. There's also one in Morong Bataan. Um, but all enterprises within uh, these uh, special, um, with, within these economic zones and freeport zones are entitled to the same uh, fiscal incentives. Another, um, Special law that grants tax incentives is the Republic Act number 7856. Uh, it discusses or grants tax incentives to regional area headquarters and uh, regional operating headquarters. So multinational companies may establish either a regional or area head headquarters uh, or a regional operating headquarters in the Philippines. 
So on RAHQ, it's a Supervision, uh, Communications, and Coordination Center for the branches, subsidiaries, or affiliates of a multinational corporation, while an ROHQ performs for such branches, subsidiaries, and affiliates those qual qualifying services that are permitted by the Act. Example, uh, administration and planning, sor sourcing and procurement, and corporate finance advisory. So um, these are the, the incentives of an RHQ and ROHQ. Uh, the third bullet point will show that for RAHQs, they are exempt from income tax and VAT because they are not allowed to earn income in the Philippines. For an ROHQ, um, it is subject to a special rate of 10% on its taxable income for the limited service that it is allowed to engage in. So I, I will I will proceed with the uh, ease of doing business act. Uh, this is another. Uh, this is a law which uh, essentially grants. Um, it builds on the anti red tape act. So it it covers all government agencies and all uh, local government units. It covers all transactions whether related to business or not. So the new measures prescribed by the 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 ease of doing business act is actually. Uh, passed this uh, just recently, 2018. So the new measures which are prescribed, um, one of which is uh, transparency. Transparency. So now the citizens' charter of the local government units should include a comprehensive and uniform checklist of requirements for each type of application that can be filed. Uh, receiving officers must now immediately inform applicants of any deficiency in their submissions, and the assessment of deficiency must be based only on the requirements found in the citizen's charter. So the officer cannot ask for um, what uh, documents that are not in their list of documents. Integrity. So there is now a zero contact policy for the pro processing of applications. So except uh, uh, when the government assesses the, suf the sufficiency of submissions, in general, um, the government can have no contact of whatever kind with applicants. So it, it should be a web-based as, as much as possible. So another um, aim of the, of the act is accountability. So there are new and additional violations and stronger penalties. So for, for erring officers, so if uh, an erring officer's uh, first for an erring officer's first offense, uh, there is a penalty. Um, uh, but after two offenses, apart from a fine and a suspicion uh, or and, a, and suspension, there will also be a criminal liability and a perpetual disqualification from public office. So another aim is um, efficiency. So the, the, the processing times for applications uh, will be shortened. So example, for simple transactions, it must be uh, acted upon within three working days. For complex transactions, seven working days. If uh, the, the agency fails to act within the periods, this will result in automatic approval, even uh, for applications for new license. The number of signatures uh, on a document has also been reduced to three. And uh, local government units are required to adopt a unified approach for business permits. And uh, as much as possible, electronic documents and there should be automation of business permitting and licensing and interconnectivity between government agencies and local government units. Um, okay, so I will turn you over to my colleague, um, Migi, for uh, he will discuss uh, labor and COVID-related uh, insurances for labor. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Migi. I'll be discussing the lab general, principle, general principles on labor law in the Philippines. So here it is. Okay, uh, just to brief you on the outline. The outline will essentially follow your relationship with your employees. So it will start at 
first, establishing your presence here in the Philippines, and second, uh, hiring your employees until uh, you terminate your relationship with your employees. So I'll also give you a legal overview just to guide you on where to look for the relevant labor laws. Okay, for the legal overview, okay, uh, it should be noted that the right of employees to security of tenure, to strike, the main conditions of work, living wage, they're all enshrined in the Constitution. This is the reason why we have labor laws which are uh, construed favorably in favor of labor. Also pursuant to the constitutional provision of guarding or regulating employer-employee relations, we have various laws on that. First is, and this is the primary law when you look at labor, employer-employee relations is that uh, is the labor code. Uh, in addition to that, the Philippines is known to be a uh, country exporting its workforce. So we also have a Migrant Workers Act. We also have an Occupational Safety and Health Standards Act. In addition to that, uh, we also have social legislation. The aim of social legislation is to give social service, services to not only employees, but also to the uh, to Filipinos in general. So as will be discussed later on, most of these social services are funded or primarily funded by contributions of employers and employees. So we have the Social, social Security Act, Universal Health Care Act, and the Home Development Mutual Fund Law, Home Development Fund Law. Another, another source of laws or guidance for employer-employee relations is uh, the decisions of the Supreme Court. Uh, pursuant to Article 8 of the Civil Code, judicial decisions or decisions of the Supreme Court form part of the legal system of the Philippines. So if you'll notice, uh, the Philippines is a hybrid actually of civil law and common law tradition. Another uh, a guideline that we can look at are the issuances of the DOLE, of the Department of Labor and Employment. In fact, under the Labor Code, the DOLE is authorized to issue implementing rules and regulations. In addition to that, the Secretary of Labor's visitorial enforcement powers to check compliance with labor laws. Okay. So going now to, 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 your, to the start of your journey in the country. The first step in your employer-employee employer, relations is that you have to register your business. Okay. And which are those? As I've mentioned, uh, there are social legislation, so you have to register with the social security system, the Home Development Mutual Fund, PhilHealth, and the Department of Labor. So for the first one, so what are the common features of social legislation? Okay. Common features are first, Employers and employees have to register with the SSS, uh, HDMF, and PhilHealth. There are also mandatory contributions from employers and employees. Employers are also required to withhold remit contributions. So this means that employers uh, deduct and withhold the contribution of employees and afterwards remits them to the proper government agency. And there are also civil and criminal penalties if there, if there is a failure to register, to remit payments, or, and or comply with the laws creating or requiring these. So for the social security system, you have to remember that the mandatory coverage starts for the employer, first day of operations, for the employee, first day of employment. Uh, this is the reason why if you have HR practitioners here, Whenever employees transfer to a new employer, one of the things that is required of an employee is to update uh, the employee's registration with the social security system. For PhilHealth, okay, of course there's an obligation to register and the employer has to report newly hired employees within 30 days. In case of separation, uh, the PhilHealth or the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation should be notified within 30 days. Employers should also keep, act, keep true and accurate records. 
and if necessary, allow the inspection of its books and records. For the HDMF, mandatory coverage is the same as those in, covered by the SSS. All employers should register prior to the start of their business operations, and employers shall register their employees within 30 days from the start of business operations or the start of employment. In the Department of Labor, employers are required to register their establishments or workplaces for the purpose of compliance and occupational safety and health. Okay. Next question, who are your employees? The obvious answer here is that those with whom you have employment contracts. Okay. But you should take note that a written employment contract is not required for the for an employer-employee relationship. In fact, in the Philippines, there are a lot of employment relationships here which are not governed by written employment contracts. So, how do we determine uh, who are employees? What tests do we use? Okay. Based on the decisions of the Supreme Court, we utilize these tests. We have the fourfold test, which is the most commonly used test. We have the economic reality test, and the, lastly, the two-tier test. For, for the fourfold test, you ask these questions. Who selects and engages the employees? Who pays their wages? Who has the power of dismissal? And who has the power of control? If your answer to all of these questions uh, point to you or point to the employer, then, then there is an employer-employee relationship. I have to take note here that the power of control, the fourth element or the fourth test, is the most important element. Power of control means control not only as to the results, but also as to the manner and means used in reaching that end. The second test is the economic reality test. So the standard here is the economic dependence of the worker on the employer in that same line of work. Okay. So we take into account economic realities. So this was applied, this economic reality test was applied in the context of a chief pathologist in a, in a hospital setting. In that case, the Supreme Court said, there's no employer-employee relationship following the economic reality test because first, the worker performs the job at the worker's own pleasure in the manner that the worker sees fit. The worker was not subject to definite hours of work and was not compensated according to the uh, amount of work, but instead he was, the worker was compensated based on the results of the work. Therefore, in that case, the Supreme Court, following the economic reality test, ruled that there's no employer-employee relationship. Okay. So what is the third test? The third test is a two-tier test. This is just actually the control test and the economic reality test. So it just the Supreme Court just combined the two. This is usually used when there's no written agreement and there's a complexity in the tasks being performed by the worker. Okay. The next would be, what are the kinds of employees? Okay. So we've discussed the, the test to determine the employer-employee relationship. So we go now to the kinds of employees and this presumes already that there is an employer-employee relationship. So these are the kinds of employees. There are seven kinds of employees, but if you'll notice, there are asterisks for the first two. I'll discuss that later. So if they're an apprentice, a probationary employee, a regular employee, project-based, project-based employee, seasonal, casual, and fixed term. So the apprentice. The essence of an apprenticeship is that the employer is helping and preparing the work for uh, for helping to prepare uh, sectors of the population to enter into the workforce. So again, you'll see here an apprenticeship is actually a practical training on the job supplemented by rhetorical instruction. So what are the, what are the other requirements for an apprenticeship? Okay. Only highly technical industries may employ apprentices in apprenticeable occupations approved by the Secretary of Labor which has now been delegated to the TESDA for the Technical Education Skills Development Authority. The apprenticeship periods will not exceed six months. 
and the apprentice is entitled to at least 75% of the applicable minimum wage. The next one is a probationary employee. So a probationary employee, is, this is a type of employee when you get, want to, to do a trial run. So you want to know if the employee uh, has the qualifications for regularization. So these are the requirements for a probationary employee. The reasonable standards for regular, regularization should be made known to the employee at the time of engagement. This is important because if the employer does not disclose the reasonable standards for regular, regularization, uh, the employee will be considered a regular employee. The probationary period should not exceed six months, but it may be extended to give the employee the chance to qualify for regularization. Okay. Now, due to the COVID-19 situation and the enhanced community quarantine being implemented here in the Philippines, the ECQ period is not included in the probationary period of six months. If the probationary employee does not qualify for the standards of regularization, a written notice should be given to the employee or to the probationary employee before the date of termination. You should also note that if a probationary employee is allowed to go to work after pro the probationary period without any qualification or without extending the probationary period, the employee will be considered a regular employee. Next, regular employee. A regular employee is an employee who performs activities which are this is more than the key word here is usually necessary and desirable in the usual business or trade of the employer. So what we look here is the reasonable connection between the activity performed by the employee and the trade or business of the employer. A defining uh, characteristic for regular employees is that regular employees may only be dismissed for just and authorized causes. I will discuss that later, but a, a defining factor here is that they enjoy the most security of tenure. We have project-based employees. So these are employees engaged for a specific project or undertaking. Their employment is co-terminus with the project and terminated at the end of the project. Uh, the completion or termination of their engagement is determined at the time of hiring or the time of engagement. Okay. Employees or project based employees should be informed of their, their status at the time of hiring. Again, the purpose here is that before the employee enters into the contract, it should be clear to the employee that the duration of the employment uh, agreement will, be, will only be for the duration of the project or the phase of the project which the employee was assigned to. Okay. Repeated rehiring of an employee for different projects does not automatically mean regular employment. And a project employee is usually uh, applicable to construction in this, to construction companies and to shipyards. Because for construction companies and shipyards, the work only comes in when they, whenever there's a project for construction companies or when there's a ship for repairing for shipyards. We also have seasonal employ, uh, employees. These are employees hired whenever there is a season requiring for their hiring. So work is seasonal in nature and the employment is only for the duration of the season. That said, there's also a decision of the Supreme Court which said that seasonal employers are those employees who are only hired for a single season. If the employers are called to work from time to time, employees will be considered as regular seasonal employees. So this was a creation of the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said for regular seasonal employees, they are really not separated from service during the off season, but temporarily laid off or on leave until re-employed. Casual employees this is the last, uh, sorry, second to the last type. These are employees who are not regular, not project-based, and not seasonal. Okay, but uh, an example here is uh, our relievers or Employees who get to work only if there is an uh, only if the regular employees are absent. If a casual employee renters at least one year of service, 
uh, the casual employee will be considered a regular employee. And the last is a fixed term employment. This is actually uh, an agreement uh, where the employer and employee agree on a fixed date of engagement, or, or they agree that by when a, fix, when a date comes, their relationship will be terminated. In order for a fixed term employment to be considered valid, they should, the fixed term employment should be voluntarily agreed upon by the parties and the employer employee should deal with each, with each other on equal footing. Salaries. For salaries, the labor code prescribes minimum standards. So that means if an employer wants to be more generous, nothing prevents the employer from being generous. And the standards do not apply to managerial employees because in reality managerial employees are actually paid higher than the usual rack and file employees. So how do we find normal hours and normal days? Normal hours are eight hours per day with a one hour break in between for meals can be reduced to 20 minutes per day, uh, 20 minutes subject to certain conditions. Employees are also entitled to one day rest after working for six consecutive days. They also follow the no work, no pay principle. What's the no work, no pay principle? It only means that if an employee does not work, the employee is generally not entitled to wages. So an exception to this is during regular holidays. Even if an employee does not work on a regular holiday, the employee is still entitled to the employee salary for that day. Okay. What now for COVID-19? Okay. If a business uh, establishment suspends operations due to a natural or man-made calamity, the employee is not required to pay the employee if the employee did not work. But for the COVID-19, the Department of Labor said that you should, the employee should charge the absences against available leave credits. And if there are no more available leave credits, then that's the time uh, you withhold payment of wages to the employees. The minimum wage here in Metro Manila, in the National Capital Region, uh, is either 500 pesos or 537 pesos. The minimum wage also varies per region, and it is set by the Regional Tripartite Wages and Productivity Board. So you'll see here in different parts of the country, there are different minimum wages, and they're usually governed by the prevailing uh, market, uh, prevailing uh, consumer price index in a particular region. So what are the usual add-ons to uh, normal wages? Okay, overtime pay, or for work rendered over eight hours. We should note that under time is not offset by overtime. Match shift differential or work from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Work from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. as additional premium. There's also a rest day premium and holiday pay. Okay. If an employee, as I've discussed earlier, does not work during a regular holiday, an employee will receive 100% of his salary. If an employee, however, works on a regular holiday, the employee is entitled to 200% of the salary. However, if an, uh, besides regular holidays, the Philippines also has special non-working holidays. Okay? If you ask what are regular holidays, what are special non-working holidays, it's just a distinction provided by law. Okay? For special non-working holidays, uh, if the employee does not work, the employee is not entitled to any pay following the no work, no pay principle. If the employee, the employee works on a special non-working holiday, there's a, the employee is entitled to 130% of his regular salary. For COVID-19 recently, we had uh, three holidays during the ECQ period. So, the Department of Labor said that for holiday pay, the employers can defer payment of holiday pay until the present situa emergency situation has abated and normal of operations of an establishment is in place. And for establishments who closed or ceased operations during the ECQ, they are not required to pay 
holiday pay. Employees in the Philippines are also, or all rank and file employees are qualified for 13th month pay. This means 13 month is just the equivalent of one twelfth of the total basic salary earned by an employee within a calendar year. And this should be paid no later than December 24, or the employer has the option to pay it in two tranches. The first tranche is usually paid before the start of the school year, and the second, no later than December 24, or during the Christmas season. Employers, uh, employees are also entitled to service incentive leave, or leave of five days with pay if they have rendered at least one year of service, and the service incentive leave can be converted to cash. How do you pay wages? You pay it in cash, you can pay it in goods, you pay it to the employee himself unless there's an authority or unless the em employee informs the employer in writing to pay it to a member of his family. Payment by check or bank transfers are allowed. So here in the Philippines, it is customary to pay or to, wait to open a payroll account for employees. And the wages are directly deposited to their payroll account. That's it's perfectly fine. Pay, uh, wages are paid at intervals not exceeding 16 days. So it's usual for employees to be paid during or every 15th and 30th of the month or sometimes some employers choose to pay them every 10th and uh, 25th of, a month, of every month. It's paid at a uh, place of work. Payment is not allowed at bars, nightclubs, drinking, or drinking establishments. Wage deductions also are not allowed, except for insurance payments, union dues, deductions required by law. So examples of these are the SSS, PhilHealth, and HDMF payments, contributions. Also, uh, withholding tax for income. Okay. And last, deductions with the written authorization of the employees for payment to the employer or third person. So an example of this one would be salary loans. Termination. There are actually four recognized grounds for termination, just an authorized cause, disease, and termination by employee. Okay, if you ask me what's the difference between just an authorized cause, just cause means with the fault of the employee, authorized cause means without the fault of the employee. Just cause. These are the usual just causes for dismissal, serious misconduct or willful disobedience, gross and habitual neglect, fraud or willful breach of trust, commission of a crime against the employer, and other analog analogous causes. Question, can you add to just causes for termination in your uh, company policy? The answer there is yes. In fact, you can define other uh, other acts which will merit the termination of an employee. So that's the reason why we recommend to our clients to issue uh, employee handbooks which define offenses and provide the corresponding penalties. Just a note to also to our clients, we also tell them that if you provide a penalty, the penalty should be commensurate with the offense of the employee. Okay, the procedure there is that first, if an employee is going to be dismissed for just causes, procedure there is to, for the employer to first give a written notice, a notice to explain to an employee, explaining there the grounds for uh, termination, giving the employee the chance to explain, and telling the employee that if there's evidence to establish the accusations against the employee, termination may be imposed on him. Okay. The employee should also be given ample opportunity to be heard, either by a written response or through and, and through a conference. If the decision is to dismiss the employee, then a second written notice should be given to the employee. The next is authorized cause. So these are the grounds, installation of labor saving devices, redundancy, retrenchment, which is usually called layoff and closure of business. 
The procedure here is that at least one month before the intended effectivity of the termination, written notices should be sent or given to the Department of Labor and Employment and to the employee. Separation pay should also be paid to the employee for these grounds, uh, installation of labor saving devices and redundancy, and retrenchment and closure not due to serious business losses. But what happens if an employer closes a business due to serious business losses? No separation pay is required. Disease. So in order to terminate an employee on the ground of disease, these are the requirements. The first one is the employee suffering from disease. The second one is the continued employment of the employee is prohibited by law or prejudicial to the employee's health or to the health of the employees, co-employees. It should be noted here that the Supreme Court has ruled that communicability of the disease is not required. The third requirement is a certification by a competent public health authority that the disease is incurable within a period of six months, even with proper medical treatment. If an employee is going to be terminated on the ground of disease, separation pay is required to be paid to the employee, and it should be noted that termination should be the last resort. Last, sorry. An employee can also cannot be dismissed because of HIV, hepatitis B, and tuberculosis, so, so long as this condition is satisfied. Last, termination by the employee. An employee may terminate his employment without cause or without reason by serving a 30 days notice to the employer. A 30 days notice is actually for the benefit of the employer. So therefore, if the employer wants to reduce the 30 days notice or wants to make the resignation effective immediately, the employer has that provocative. If the employee does not give a 30 days notice, the employee may be held liable for damages by the employer. Suspension of operations. A bon an employee is not terminated for bona fide suspension of operations not exceeding six months, or if the employee is called to fulfill a military or civic duty. Employers in these cases, the employer is required to reinstate the employee if the employee uh, indicates his desire to be reinstated to work within month, one month from assumption of operations or relief from military civic duty. In light of the COVID-19 outbreak, the Department of Labor's issued guidelines encouraging employers to adopt flexible work arrangements instead of closing shop or dismissing employees on the ground of authorized costs. So these are the examples of the flexible work arrangements, a reduction of work hours and or work days, rotation of workers, forced leave, and other arrangements agreeable to the employers and employees. Termination disputes. The first stage of a termination dispute is, a, is the referral of the dispute to the single entry approach. The, the single entry approach is just actually a venue for the parties to amicably settle the dispute. The Senate does not decide the merits of each party's claim or defense. If there is no settlement as in the, at the single entry approach, the matter will be referred to the labor arbiter. In the labor arbiter, there will be another round of mediation hearings or conferences. If there is no settlement, the labor arbiter will order the parties to submit their position papers, their evidence and testimonies of their witnesses. And afterwards, the labor arbiter will render a decision. And then afterwards, if either party is not happy with the decision, an appeal can be filed with the National Labor Relations Commission. And afterwards, the appellate process would be, afterwards it would be the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. Just to note, corporate officers or claims of corporate officers for illegal termination are not within the jurisdiction of labor courts. If you ask me who are corporate officers, they're office, officers whose office was created 
by the corporations, articles of incorporation or bylaws, and the officer was elected or appointed by the board of directors. Okay, the common claims and termination disputes. First claim is, of course, legal dismissal. It can be classified into actual legal dismissal or constructive legal dismissal. Constructive legal dismissal, that only means that the employer did everything to make the environment hostile such that the employee has no choice but to resign. Uh, employees also in termination disputes usually claim back wages, or the wages that they should have earned from the time that they were dismissed. They also ask for reinstatement or separation pay in lieu of reinstatement, damages and attorney's fees. What if the employee is illegally dismissed? The employee may be awarded reinstatement, and if this is awarded by the labor, labor arbiter, it is immediately exec executory even pending appeal. Therefore, if reinstatement is awarded by the labor arbiter, the employer may choose between actual reinstatement or reinstatement in the payroll. If reinstatement is no longer possible, separation pay can be awarded to the employee. The employee can also be awarded back wages, damages, and attorney's fees. That ends our presentation for the lab general labor principles. Thank you. And as we say, salamat. And again, just to do a recap, uh, I'm Miggy Lazaro. I presented uh, the, I made the presentation on labor laws. Uh, the one before me was uh, Roxanta Dike Fajardo. She made the presentation on tax. And the first one to present among us is Deborah. Miriam Sobrepena Lacson. And if you have any questions, you can reach us in these contact details. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, McGee. Um, so I think we can move on to the questions and answers. I think most of the Q&As, uh, we tried to respond to them already um, through the chat. Uh, Darren, did you want to uh, answers to the questions or okay yeah sure um we need to leave by four o'clock for we have another call sure. for enterprise singapore so we'll just look through the list of questions and um highlight some of those that are relevant to us yeah so if i look at the questions uh, uh there's a question by leonard chua about what about fmd um i believe it's actually for cng yeah, uh, I think I answered a similar question. Well, uh, uh, food and beverage and r restaurant services have been classified as retail trade. So it would be subject to the foreign equity restrictions and the capitalization requirements for FNB. So some uh, what, of, what our other clients would do sometimes is they would have franchise agreements or similar contractual arrangements to work around the capitalization requirements. Okay, yeah, so from uh, Enterprise Singapore side, I think we just want to thank everyone for participating in the webinar. Um, the slides will be circulated by SPF um, and we really look forward. We have our contact details there as well. So uh, feel free to email us or to reach out to us for further assistance. Um, when COVID-19 is over, we are happy to see um, guys in market as well. Yeah, so that is from Enterprise Singapore, I guess. Uh, Derek, do you want to close the session? Yeah. So thank you everyone for joining this webinar and um, those who sign up for the one-to-one -one consultation, do not forget to log in to the Webex and thank you speakers from Enterprise Singapore and CNG Law. Uh, we really had a very good session today and we look forward to the next session. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.